All right. Well, we're in chapter 11, and we will actually, of Romans, we will finish the uh, uh, theological section of the book, start the uh, practical uh, next week in chapter 12. So if you've uh, been here for all the studies and paid attention, still have your notes in a binder, you will receive a uh, postgraduate degree uh, here in the mail within a few weeks because uh, so it's a pretty heavy study. Romans is not an easy book to go through, uh, and a lot of people simply avoid chapter 9, 10, and 11 because they don't know what to deal uh, with it uh, because historically, and even today, 85% of the church disagree with the Apostle Paul and what he has to say in these chapters dealing with the, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, we began this chapter uh, in verses 1 to 10 and talked about the believing remnant. And uh, uh, no, God is not done with his people Israel. And he uses a rhetorical question several times to introduce that thought in each case. Then says, certainly not or absolutely no. God is still dealing with, is going to deal with, there is a future uh, for the nation of Israel. Uh, he makes this point at the beginning of the chapter, the believing remnant. He says, by the way, I'm one of them. And then he gives the illustration of Elijah. Elijah thought he was the only one. Tells God, I'm the only one that hasn't bowed my knee as he was running from Ahab and Jezebel. And of course, the Lord says, no, you've got that a little wrong. There are 7,000 others. Those are his illustrations. There's a believing remnant today. It's much larger than you actually think it is. And in fact, there has been a believing remnant of Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah in every generation and every century since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There has been believing rabbis within Judaism that believe Jesus is the Messiah who died for their sins and rose again in every generation since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's always been a remnant. There's always been a, a believing remnant. That was Paul's point uh, in the first 10 verses. But then we saw in verse 11 to 24, there was a temporary rejection as the nation. As we pointed out several times, probably need to mention again that we're never talking about, Paul's never talking about individual believers here in these chapters. He's always talking about one of two groups of people. Again, according to the Bible, there's only one race. It's called the human race. And there's only two ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles. And he's talking about those two groups of people people here and for Israel, not individually, uh, but as an, a group of people, there has been the rejection of the Messiah. Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. John begins his gospel telling us that. He'll have more to say about that in this text, but there'll be a future restoration. We saw that in verse 25 to 32, uh, and then we conclude the chapter today uh, entitled, all, all Israel Will Be Saved. If we don't understand chapters 9, 10, and 11, we said three things would happen. We would fail in our mission to evangelize Jewish people, which we have. Uh, oh, by the way, we will fall into anti-Semitism, which we have in terms of the church. And some of the greatest atrocities against the Jewish people have been committed by people that call themselves Christians. Again, that includes 85% of Christians in the world today. All of Roman Catholicism, all of uh, the Orthodox churches, all the Reformed churches uh, do not hold to what uh, we're about ready to study uh, this morning. And they have fallen into anti-Semitism. Uh, it's groups of people. Uh, and just on a practical note, you've got whole denominations in the United States currently that have now withheld all of their stocks and funding and retirement accounts to any company that has anything to do with the nation of Israel. We had Dr. Ice with us from Liberty University a couple of years ago. He had a great message about this entitled, The New Anti-Semitism. They won't straight out and come against Jewish people, but they will come against the nation of Israel. And we know prophetically there will come a time when all the nations of the earth will turn against tiny Israel. And third, we'll fail to trust the promises of God. This is Paul's whole point. Israel becomes the illustration. He goes through all these wonderful doctrines of justification, sanctification, what it is to walk with the Lord and walk according to the Spirit. Gets to chapter 8, the wonderful promise that begins there, therefore is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Ends the chapter and nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus and he says, and you can count on it and count on God's promises. Just look at the nation of Israel. All the promises made to them are going to come true. 
Well, let's take a look at uh, their, our first point because uh, it answers the question we left you with uh, last time in our study in verse 25. The, Israel is, uh, the reason Israel is not saved, again, remember uh, his uh, previous uh, illustration with that of an olive tree. You have a natural olive tree. You have a wild olive tree. The natural is Israel. The wild is Gentiles. Uh, he says the, the wild olive tree has been grafted into the natural so that it could bear fruit. And, of course, in the world today, the world of horticulture, you can't do that. You can't take something wild and graft it in and have it bear fruit. You can do the opposite. You can take an olive tree that is bearing fruit. You can graft it into the wild olive tree that is not bearing fruit, and it will continue. So what he's saying is that God's done something supernatural. If you're Gentile and you're saved, it's a supernatural work of God because his called elect people are Israel. All the covenants are promised to Israel. All the prophecies are for Israel. The Jewish Messiah, Jesus, is for Israel. So for Gentiles to come in, it's a supernatural work of God. We even say we must be born again. It's an amazing thing. So it leads the question, begs the question, then, oh, then the natural, the Jews, should be getting saved left and right when they hear the gospel. So why aren't they? And he answers that question here in, uh, in verse 25. It says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. A couple of things about the reason. <clears throat> the first one he states by saying we shouldn't be ignorant of this. Now, it's interesting. You could do a whole study of every time Paul or, or Peter or somebody says, and don't be ignorant of this, and you'll find out we're pretty ignorant <laughs> when it comes to these things. In Acts 3, uh, Peter says, we shouldn't be ignorant of the prophecies of the Messiah, that he had to suffer and die. But, but uh, the Jewish people at that time were, were pretty ignorant of that. Paul in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 4, says, we should not be ignorant of the rapture of the church. And yet there's uh, still lots of people out there today that are ignorant of this important doctrine of the rapture of the church. In 2 Peter 3, 8, 9, Peter says we shouldn't be ignorant of the day of the Lord, of the Lord's return. Some people get the rapture and the day of the Lord and all mixed up and not sure what they're about. We're still pretty ignorant about these saints. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. I'm glad that's not a problem. No, that is a problem. Yet it's a big controversy within the church. Do they exist for today? Yeah, but only some. No, not at all. And, the, uh, and uh, you know, nobody's really reading their Bible on this. And we're ignorant of these things. Uh, it's no wonder that uh, he sits here. I don't want you to be ignorant of what's going on with Israel today. The second thing he says about the reason is that it's a mystery. Now, again, when the... Uh, the New Testament writers use this term. They're not thinking about a mystery novel. <clears throat> we don't know who did it, but in the end we might, we might find out. No, it means something that was not known in the past that is now known. We didn't know in the past that about the church, but now we know the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles together. That was a mystery to the Old Testament believers. It's been revealed. Israel and their future has been a mystery. It is no longer a mystery. And then he states the reason uh, for uh, why Israel is not being saved, the natural olive tree, it's a temporary blindness. Use the word blinding. Some translations use the word hardening. And again, we would say certainly that it's as a nation, uh, not individually. Uh, it is neither total nor is it final. And, uh, and some would even teach and here's how the, the teaching goes that is uh, greatly misunderstood, that all Israel is all partially blinded or all partially hardened. Therefore, they cannot, will not receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they cannot receive it because they're par all partially blinded, there's no point in sharing the gospel or preaching the gospel or having anything to do with evangelism to the Jewish people. God will deal with them later. They've rejected God. They've rejected the Messiah. The church now has an inherited or replaced Israel in terms of all of those uh, promises. That is not what it says in the English. It's not what it says in the Greek. It is not what it says in context because Paul's talking about, hey, I'm saved. <laughs> there's always been a remnant uh, and there's going to be a remnant <clears throat> and the reason that <clears throat> there aren't more saved now is because uh, part of them 
as a nation, not individually, has experienced uh, blindness in part. <clears throat> my problem is I get kind of excited on this subject and I kind of wear my whole voice out. And then Mark has to go do a bunch of songs that I like and a new one that I like. And so you'll have to bear with me. And if you know this already, then just pray for me. Paul states the reason for the temporary blindness. <clears throat> it's simply a portion of the people, and it's only for a period of a time. <clears throat> Notice when it will end. Uh, it will end when this term, until the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, comes in. Now, the times of the Gentiles is a similar phrase found in Luke 21, where Jesus says, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So the times of the Gentiles, in that case, is a reference to the control of Jerusalem. And therefore, some, you know, maybe rightly so, <clears throat> said that that period of time, Gentiles controlling Jerusalem, that period of time ended in 1967. So the, the times of the Gentiles are, are piled. They're over. It's done. It's been completed. Israel has control again. It was being trampled by the Gentiles for a period of time, but it's over. Um, there's, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, they don't have control of the Temple Mount. Uh, but again, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Or we could say it's completed <clears throat> until they have complete control. A couple of things uh, about this. One is the word times does not refer to chronological time. Uh, the word refers to seasons of times and suggests gaps in time. And there's been gaps in times. There's been times when the Jews have gained control and when they've lost it again. They had contempor uh, temporary control in 164 to 163 under the Maccabean period. They had temporary control under, against the uh, Romans in uh, 66 to 70 uh, AD. Uh, the Bar Kopa revolt in 132 to 135, they had control for a three-year period. Uh, and now since 1967, uh, they have control again. And that won't be on a test or anything. I'm just kind of giving you some examples. Uh, they'll have it again. They have it now, but it's just for a period of time because we know in the middle, <coughs> middle of the uh, tribulation, the Antichrist will take control of the city again. And it won't be till Jesus Christ returns that they get complete re control and remain in that period uh, for, uh, for eternity at that point. So the times of the Gentiles ruling in Jerusalem will not exist until the return of Jesus Christ. Here, he's talking about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. Now, he's already made reference back in verse 12 to it when he says, how much more their fullness, the Gentiles. So really, he's talking about salvation. So when a completed number, the fullness of the Gentiles receiving salvation, when that comes in, when that happens, <clears throat> then the partial blindness to the nation will end. So when will that happen? I'm glad you asked that question, <clears throat> even though it's going to take me a little bit to get it out. It will happen uh, again at the end of the tribulation period. And then uh, that kind of uh, begs the question, because Gentiles are getting saved uh, during the tribulation period uh, at a great price. You know, we sometimes, uh, I don't know if you ever you know, read the Jerry Jenkins, Tim LaHaye books about, you know, the rapture and this is going to happen. These guys are underground. They're sharing the God, you know. Well, yeah, kind of, except that when someone receives the Lord, they get martyred uh, pretty quickly. So how are Gentiles getting saved during the tribulation period? Well, uh, it's through 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from every tribe that God puts a seal on and protects them so they can't be destroyed by the Antichrist. That's what the book of Revelation tells us. And they're going to go throughout the world preaching the gospel. And it seems to be indicated there that God enables them even in language uh, because we find at a point in time by Revelation 7, 9, Gentiles have come to faith in Christ from every tribe and language and tongue and every, every planet, every, every language group on the earth. There's going to be somebody from that group that hears the gospel, responds to it, and they're going to be uh, in heaven with us. And it's going to be because a Jewish person that has come to faith in Christ is supernaturally protected by God is out preaching the gospel. Now, I don't know, you know, we've already talked about our, uh, our heritage and our roots being in Judaism. And Paul says, so don't be proud about what you've given in terms of the mercy and the grace of God. 
But this, this is another little thing I was thinking about. You know, at the rapture of the church, <clears throat> we probably all will have people that we love that are not raptured. I mean, I, that'd be an awesome thought <clears throat> that everybody you care about, everybody you love, when the rapture happens, you're all going. I mean, that, that would be awesome, except it's probably not going to be the case. There's probably going to always be people that God puts in your path that you have a heart for. If they get saved after the rapture, it's probably going to be because a Jewish person comes to them and shares the gospel with them, and they get saved. So be good to the Jewish people. Some of them are out there, maybe that person. And uh, certainly you've got more reason than that, but I just thought that was an interesting thought. Of course, that begs the question, <clears throat> if all the Gentiles get raptured at the church and you've got 144,000 Jews that are out there sharing the gospel, how do they get saved? Well, they watch one of those tapes that you left behind or something. No, actually, it's through two witnesses. Two witnesses there in Jerusalem, again, supernaturally protected by God. They appear to be Old Testament figures that God has brought back. Somebody that would have an uh, appeal uh, to uh, Jewish listeners. Uh, and they've got <coughs> awesome supernatural power. When the Antichrist tries to come against them, they're able to call fire down from heaven. And, uh, and destroy them and protect themselves and they're able to preach the gospel. Uh, they uh, go on for a period of time and the world hates them. The Antichrist hates them, of course, because they're, they're clearly sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at a point in time, it appears that he has been able to kill them and the world is celebrating. They're so excited that these two guys are dead that they exchange gifts, one, uh, one with another, if you remember that, uh, that passage. After three days, though, what happens? They're, they're resurrected, and apparently it's on CNN because uh, uh, the whole world literally will see uh, these two guys resurrected from the dead. That's how the 144,000 get saved. In terms of the identity of those two guys, the Bible is very clear. I like what uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says. He says very clearly the identity of these two men are they're Jewish men. That's, so now you know who they are. But there's uh, other guys like uh, Dr. Uh, David Hawking. They would say, it's Moses and Elijah. We see them appear uh, on the scene like the uh, transfiguration of Jesus. And of course, if you had Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, both come back preaching the gospel in Jerusalem with all eyes on them. There'd just be a few Jewish people that might be willing to listen to that. There's more than one rabbi around today that said, if Moses comes back and tells me Jesus is the Messiah, I'll believe it. And they will. And they will. More than the 144,000, but 144,000 will be supernaturally protected by God until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then for the nation themselves, that blindness will finally, that partial blindness will be removed. Now, secondly the nation will receive the Messiah. Of course, this is still yet future, verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the nation will receive the Messiah in the future. Here Paul's quoting Isaiah 59, 20, and 21. If you continue to read on into chapter 60, you'll see a, a fuller, uh, really beautiful picture uh, of what's happening there in terms of the salvation of this remnant of believers at the end of the tribulation period. But notice the promise, it's to all Israel. And uh, sometimes this is uh, misunderstood. Now, we're going to, here sometime in the next couple of weeks, we're going to go down to Kailua Beach after a church, and we're going to have a, a potluck, and we're going to have a bit of baptism. And I would say, we're all going to go down. And uh, we're going to have the potluck and the baptism. We're going to have a great time. I hope that you'll join us. Now, do I mean by that that every person that ever attended Calvary Chapel when we're down through the years will be there that day? No, that's not what I mean. I don't even think that everybody that is there that morning, you know, you ought to be there that morning will be down there. But generally, as a group, that's what we're going to be doing. All Israel will be saved. All Jewish people that have ever lived, no. All Jewish people living during that time period at the end of the tribulation, no. But at least millions will be because Zechariah tells us that a third of the Jewish people living on the planet at that time will be part of that remnant where the blindness is removed and they will look on the one they have pierced and mourn for one as they mourn 
for an, as an only child. Zechariah tells us God will keep them supernaturally protected, intact, away from the Antichrist until that happens. And it seems like we're getting close to those times because God seems to be preparing the hearts of the, of the Jewish people. Just a couple of things that, uh, that are interesting. Uh, one is the fact that um, you may not know that uh, it's only about 16% of, of Israelis that read their Bible at all, about 16%. It's largely a, a, secular, a secular state. But uh, on the other hand, every high school student is required to memorize the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, including the writings of Moses and, and the prophets. They've got to memorize it. And, uh, you know, like we do in our schools here, you know, Bible memory is really... No, it used to be, used to be, but it's not anymore. But it is there. Now, these kids may not care. They just got to do it to graduate, memorize it. Teachers may think they don't believe in it, but it's good for them. It's good moral teaching. Whatever their reasoning, they do it. We've got a generation of young people that have memorized the prophecies concerning the Messiah of Jesus, uh, concerning Jesus Christ. It's there. <laughs> it's not on the front burner, but it's there in their minds. The program has been downloaded, you know. Somebody's just got to uh, boot it up and activate it, uh, and I think that's going to happen uh, in the near future in terms of this generation, that generation at that time receiving Jesus as the Messiah. One of the other interesting things going on in Israel today uh, is what's happening with their prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and what uh, his own life experience has brought him to. Um, he is certainly, pray for him, he certainly seems to be a believing Jew. And uh, he, uh, a few years ago, mentioned the fact that his father-in-law, his wife's dad, was really the, uh, the spiritual leader of, of their home and credits him with discipling and teaching and training his own children uh, in the word of God. And uh, in fact, uh, one of his sons is... Uh, when a, a national competition in just uh, uh, basically a, like a spelling bee is to spelling words, uh, the Bible and content of the Bible and so forth. And in Israel, you can imagine that's a big deal. Uh, and uh, at the uh, reception of that award, um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke and gave credit to his father-in-law. Well, then his father-in-law passes away about a year ago. And he says uh, that uh, at the loss of his father-in-law, I must take upon myself uh, the spiritual mantle and responsibility for my own family. And since then, every Shabbat, every Saturday, every Sabbath day, he gathers in his home, the official residency of the prime minister, several conservative rabbis, and he knows personally, he gathers his family around and they study the Bible for two to three hours every, every Saturday to, uh, together. As a result of that, when you hear his <coughs> national addresses, which you're not going to get on a lot of American TV, uh, but if you go and listen to him uh, online or whether he's at the UN or national speech, he quotes scripture all the time. And he takes scripture and he applies it to the current situation of what is going on in the world. And people in Israel are hearing the word of God. Kids are growing up memorizing the word of God. There's a generation that's being prepared for the partial blindness to be removed and to cry out and to receive the Messiah. And I think we're living uh, in, in those days. Jesus himself tells us, again, that Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Uh, and I don't think that's going to happen until Jesus returns again. But one day, all Israel... I think at the end of that tribulation will be saved again. Secondly, the reception of the Messiah will be based on a covenant relationship. Uh, we see that in the text. This is all about what do, God's doing for them uh, because of those that were fathers. It's not apostrophe S. It's the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God made certain promises to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and he's going to keep his word to them. Uh, when it says all Israel then must refer, one writer said uh, all, all, then, all Israel then must refer to the forgiveness of the whole people or nation, the whole ethnic group in contrast to the saved remnant of Jews in Paul's day and ours. It is a whole people rather than a small part that will be converted to uh, the Messiah. Now it's very easy to see you can't spiritualize this uh, and somehow say that this is the church uh, God will deal with Israel in the future. 
Third, the nation remains the elect of God. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. There it is, fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, all Jews and Gentiles, that he might have mercy on them all, all and Jews and Gentiles. The nation remains first enemies of the gospel, and they do. That's this is the current state of Israel today. Uh, they are enemies of the gospel. In fact, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Orthodox Jews uh, have their uh, own political party. Uh, they have two, but basically they kind of uh, group together when it comes to uh, trying to get a position or a seat uh, on the cabinet of the prime minister once uh, uh, they are elected to the Knesset. Uh, and uh, there's only one seat that the uh, conservative or ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, Jews want. It's the one pertaining to visas. They want to be able to control who gets into the country, who gets a visa from the country, because they want to make sure that nobody bringing the gospel gets in and gets a permanent uh, uh, residency or, or gets a visa. Now, we've got a couple of folks that are good friends, personal friends that we support uh, that are over there. Uh, one uh, had to basically <laughs> erase his history uh, as being a, uh, a Messianic rabbi or, or pastor uh, because if that was found out, he would have never got his uh, permanent residency. Uh, his, he made Aliyat, moved there with his, uh, uh, his family. He would have never got it because they're still enemies of the gospel at this point in time. Uh, the other one, and obviously not mentioning him by, uh, by name intentionally, but the other one uh, is a whole interesting, interesting story. He gets in and he gets a visa because he's working on his, uh, his PhD and he's working on it a long time. <laughs> Just can't quite seem to... Get done with that PhD, you know, so he can stay there as long as he can. He's been there a long while, and they're going like, uh, I think you're going to have to leave soon. Uh, and then uh, just, a, just, just a funny twist and just show you how God in the sovereignty works. Um, last time he and his wife were here with us, they tell us this whole story. He says, yeah, it was getting kind of dicey in regards to our visa. And then I get, uh, and you keep in mind, this is a guy from South America, speaks with a heavy Spanish accent. He's got a ministry of Jewish people in Israel. Go figure. Uh, uh, but he, uh, he gets saved. Uh, somebody uh, sends him uh, up to Moody Bible Institute, go to college, sponsor him. He goes there, and he kind of falls under the tutelage or the mentorship of uh, uh, one of the Jewish teachers there. Uh, works in the summer with uh, outreaches to Jewish people in New York. Kind of gets a heart for it, and he goes on. I believe he went to Biola for his uh, graduate school. A couple of other uh, uh, Jewish teachers there, Messianic Jews that are teaching on staff. Oh, they have a big influence on him. So, so how does he, so he becomes a, an evangelist to, to Jewish people, flies all over the world uh, doing it and everything. Very, and if you know, a very passionate guy. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're telling him in Israel, we're not really sure we're going to give you, they're giving, him a hard, they're giving him a hard time. They're giving him a real hard time about his visa. He gets a letter from his, uh, from his brother, South America. It says, uh, I don't know if mom ever told you, but our name, that's not really our last name. Um, and I won't, I'm not going to mention his name. And he's like, our last name is really this. And he tells him the last name. It's a Spanish name. It's a Spanish Jewish name. And he studied, you know, he, you know he's got a heart for Jews. He has, uh, you know, studied all about the, the Jews that were driven out of uh, Spain and settled in uh, different parts of South America. And when did they do that? 1492. Right? That's a very important date because that's when a Jewish sailor got on a boat and sailed for the, uh, the New World to try to find it. And, uh, uh, and in the process of doing it, was trying to get out of town because that's when the Spanish Inquisition began. And that's when a lot of Jews had to flee Spain uh, at that time. And, uh, and so, he, almost said his name. So his family, anyway, he's got the records and everything. So now he's able to, he's putting this all together. Flew back to that, his country of origin, got his birth records, the right birth certificate and all this stuff. That's kind of weird, right? You're, you're like, uh, you know, 40 years old. And by the way, your last name, that's not your last name. Anyway, he's, he's applying for permanent residency now. And uh, it's just very interesting, you know, how God works in these things. And here's a guy that just followed the leading of the Lord. And a lot of people would look at that guy, that guy and go, 
you're the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm trying to reach those people. No, he, he can use anybody. He can use anybody. But uh, today, this is true. The nation remains enemy of the gospel. What should we do about it? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Blinded, a partial blindness. But hey, you've got friends and family members that are blinded as well. As you try to share the gospel and there seems to be no interest, they don't understand, it has no appeal, and you understand this verse and realize, how do we remove that blindness? And it's through prayer. We pray, don't we? Lord, remove the blindness that the enemy has placed on their eyes. Help them see the light of the gospel of Christ, which is the glory of God. We try to see that blindness removed through prayer. Uh, and certainly... We can do that individually with Jews and Gentiles today. God is going to do it corporately uh, at a point in time in the future. Secondly, there remains the elect of God. Uh, they remain the elect of God for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob. Notice that God's gifts and our calling are irrevocable. Uh, election simply means choice, uh, which Paul has already stated very clearly as the same it is for us. It's by grace. It's never by merit and uh, and basically Paul is saying God will never change his mind because of the promise he made to Abraham Isaac and Jacob those covenants which are unconditional and are everlasting Malachi 3 6 says about the Lord I am the Lord I change not numbers 23 19 says God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should uh, repent uh, Romans 3.3, 3, he said earlier, shall their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? No, it, uh, it doesn't at all. Uh, again, look at verse 29 again. When it says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, it's a very interesting word. Now, some, uh, some translations in English will use the word instead of irrevocable that actually use without repentance. That's really the, gives the wrong, uh, wrong misunderstanding. Uh, it's not the word that we use for repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not that word. It's the word that's used of Judas. When Judas basically sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, and then he is sorrowful over what he has done because it hasn't worked out the way he thought it was. Again, in a sense, he repented or was sorrowful, and he went and hung himself. That's the word that's used here. And Paul is saying... God is never sorrowful over having committed himself to the Jewish people. God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. They rejected the Messiah, but God has never been sorrowful over choosing those people. That's what he's saying here. He says, the gifts and the calling, my promises, I've never been sorry about it. I just think, you know, there's certainly a broader application to us. You know, all the times that we stumble and we fall, you know, we can kind of go back to the Romans 8.1, and we should. There's no condemnation. Uh, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And yet we all live at times, to some degree, under a certain amount of condemnation. Wonderful, wonderful thing that God says about, his, about Israel. They can reject the Messiah, and I still am not sorry about the promises I've made to them. And in the end, all Israel is going to be saved. It just speaks to us of God's reliability and that we can count on his promises. Fourth, the nation will rede be redeemed in the future. Again, the redemption of Gentiles, very clearly, he says, is based on mercy. And he repeated or reminds us uh, that we have a spiritual obligation to provoke them to jealousy not just provoke them that provoke them to jealousy uh, it's a hardness that's only in part uh, that it doesn't mean that individual jews can't be saved all are in unbelief all are in disobedience there is no difference paul says here and we need to remember that and remember that we have gotten saved if you're a gentile because uh, in thee, God says to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that's the blessing, is Jesus the Messiah who dies on the cross so our sins can be forgiven. Uh, they've been disobedient. He says, you've been disobedient, and I saved you. Don't you think I'll save them 
in the end as well. And then the redemption of Israel, again, as we just said, is based on mercy. Verse 31, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. Even so, these, the Jewish people, have been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, you Gentiles, you may also obtain mercy. We could put it this way. How do we reach Jewish people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Should I read a book, go to a seminar? Those aren't bad things. It kind of helps. There's some thing, helpful things to know, <laughs> to not say as well as to, uh, to say. Uh, but the way that they will be saved is as we show mercy to them, as we show mercy to them. Love and kindness go a long ways in trying to share the gospel with somebody. But what if they yell at me? We'll just show them mercy. That's give them what they don't deserve. Kill them with kindness uh, is, uh, is the idea. And, um, you know, we're, we've just kind of been, we're the ones that have been blinded to the idea that you can't lead a Jewish person to faith in Christ. And nothing could be uh, further from the truth. That's part of what Paul is, uh, is saying here. It's not going to happen as a nation, as a group, until the end of the tribulation, until the fullest and the number of the Gentiles have come in. Uh, but it can still happen as we show them mercy. Now, Paul gets to verse 33 and uh, 36 and basically worships the Lord. I don't know if there's, a, there's not really a, a pardon me, excuse me, I just can't help this right now. Uh, but that's the idea. What it says, and I've entitled it, none of us can realize or comprehend the greatness of God. And basically, this is a, what we call a doxology. It was sung uh, by, by the early church, and it's not the only time Paul does it. He does it in Ephesians 1, 2, when he's talking about uh, uh, the glories of heaven and all that await, awaits us. He just stops at some point uh, and begins to, uh, to worship the Lord. I, uh, several years ago, when David Hawking had just stopped uh, teaching at the uh, Bible College, at the Calvary Chapel Bible College, and uh, man, what a treat for uh, uh, folks that were <laughs> going to school at that time to have uh, 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 David come in and, uh, and teach for... Uh, uh, a couple of semesters there, but uh, they were available online. So I would go in and watch his classes and, and uh, while I was eating my lunch in the office and stuff and kind of went through all the ones that were available. Uh, and they're, they're really not there anymore, so I'm glad that I caught him when I did. But it would crack me up. And, of course, if you know David, you would appreciate it because he'd, be, he'd do the same thing. Uh, he would be teaching through uh, wonderful in the mercy of God and, and he would just stop and then just start in this big booming voice start singing some old hymn the old rugged cross or amazing grace and you could tell he is zoned he is not even paying attention to these kids at all then he'd just stop and go well praise the Lord that was good where was I and then he'd go back he'd just like it's all too good let's just stop and worship the Lord that, that's what Paul's doing here when he says oh the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Uh, again, what he's uh, doing here is simply saying that we really cannot comprehend uh, the greatness of God. He mentions first the wisdom uh, and the knowledge of God. One writer said, knowledge is the gathering of information and wisdom is knowing what to do with it. And he has all the information. He has all knowledge is the idea. And he has all wisdom. And we certainly should marvel at it and be thankful for it. He says, we can't really uh, realize how unsearchable are his judgments. One translator uh, translated unfathomable. We can't understand the idea in the NIV beyond tracing out is a little closer because it's the term when someone would track an animal uh, in, in the woods. You can't do it. There's no tracks. You just can't do it uh, is, is the idea, which is why we don't always understand God's methods and his timing and why he does what he does. Uh, they're just beyond our, our comprehension. C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles, uh, uses the illustration uh, of uh, two sh shellfish that are having a conversation. And uh, they're having a conversation about what human beings are, are like. Uh, so he says, quote, so one of them tells them that man has no shell. Uh, he's not attached to a rock and he doesn't reside in water. To help the first shellfish get the idea of cross, 
Another learned shellfish expands on his statement, finally concluding that man is a sort of uh, amphorious jelly. Uh, he has no shell existing, nowhere in particular. He's not attached to a rock. Uh, and he's never taken in nourishment because there's no water to uh, drift it towards him. And the conclusion is man is a famished jelly existing in a dimensionless void. And that's two shellfish trying to explain what human beings are like. For us to try to understand God and understand what he is like, we're lost. I mean, we can look at creation and go, man, the majesty, the power uh, of God, his creative ability, his, his uh, forces to, to uh, speak something out of nothing into something. You know, we, we have the special revelation of God in terms of his word, and then we have the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but still yet, Paul says, we'll never really comprehend uh, who he is. And we'll never be able to realize, and thirdly, how great his mercy is. No one can be a debtor to, uh, to God, Paul says. No one's ever given to God that God should repay him. I know there's a few preachers that say that. You give this and God will owe you. He'll do this for you. Send in that money today, you know, and, uh, and they, they go on. Your seed money, and it'll be multiplied. Why don't they just multiply their own? Why are they asking for other people? I, I don't understand that, you know. I, you know, it would be nice to have a little handkerchief um, uh, anointed by the Apostle Paul himself. I'm not sure how they get those, but uh, I'd like to have one one day. Uh, I just don't know that uh, it would really give me any more money in my wallet. But uh, uh, Paul says no one's ever given to God that God should repay him. And then lastly... We see his glory and his power uh, because he says everything originates from him. Everything is from him. He originates everything. Everything is, uh, is to him. He sustains it all. Uh, and uh, in the end, everything is from him. And we could say that in regards to salvation. Salvation is from him. God ordained the plan, the hour he promised it, the moment Jesus would come. He elected the heirs of salvation called to eternal life. Salvation is also through him. It came through the prophecies. The son had to be born. It came through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The word had to be preached for us to be able to hear it. And salvation is ultimately to him. It's meant for one single purpose, to give him glory. You and I uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ for for one single purpose, in a sense, to give glory to God. We sometimes say it's our mission in life uh, to know God and make him known to others, but it's to know God and make him known to others in a way that he receives the glory from it because he is deserving uh, of it all. That's what Paul is just stops and he just worships uh, in this whole thing. And, uh, and certainly, I pray that there's times when we're reading the word ourselves uh, and, that's, uh, and that's where we, we end up in, uh, in worship. I just want to end with a couple little quotes uh, in regards to this whole idea of Israel, their future, and of course, uh, how we uh, deal uh, with Israel and the Jewish people today. Uh, so, uh, if you want a little more academic side of things, this is a, a great little book, To the Jews First. Uh, its uh, editors are, are um, Daniel L. Bach and Mitch uh, Glasner. Every chapter is uh, uh, by a different, uh, different speaker at a conference, put it together in a book. Uh, Arnold's got a couple of chapters in here, some other uh, great chapters, but uh, just to read a, a little bit from this. And this is a, a quote from what we call the Diary of Anne Frank, because one of the things that is, uh, certainly makes it difficult to share the gospel with Jewish people is not just the church uh, and through the centuries and our misunderstanding of this, but the Holocaust itself. Not only because Hitler used portions of Romans 9, 10, and 11 to substantiate his, his uh, Holocaust to the Jews, to the church, that not all, but most of it went right along with him. Uh, and, uh, and they became quite aware of that and were told as they were being, being killed uh, that it was because they were the Christ killers. Uh, and you can imagine there were 1,400 a day uh, being killed uh, and a large portion of them, well over a million were children uh, during this period of time. And uh, uh, what it's done to Judaism itself is certainly left a scar upon it because of them and their own faith, of course, questioning, where's God? You know, how can he, you know, we all say that sometimes when we get a flat tire, you know, where's God? How can he allow this to happen? Doesn't he know how busy I am? 
Well, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, you and your family and everybody you know being taken to the ovens. There'd be a little bit of questioning going on. Now, I mentioned there were evangelists that knew the Lord uh, in those camps, and we know that, trying to give the hope of Christ. But Anne Frank, uh, the title of the book actually is The Diary of a Young Girl, writes, uh, Who has afflicted this upon us? Who has made us Jews different from all other people? Who has allowed us to suffer so terribly up to now? It is God that has made us as we are. But he will be God too, who will raise us up again. So in the midst of that, there are still those that, that had hope uh, and uh, uh, breathtaking, to say the least, to us. Uh, one uh, set of rabbi uh, trapped inside the Holocaust kingdom wrote, uh, for the faithful, there are no questions. For the non-believer, there's no answers. That's, that's where Judaism is today. Uh, a, lot, a lot with the questions. The way majority with the questions. How could this happen? How could this happen to us? But the way that we will see them come to faith in their Messiah is if we live out and understand Romans 9, 10, and 11. And if we will simply show them mercy. That's the most powerful way. That's what Paul is suggesting here. I'd say he's a pretty good authority on winning somebody to faith in Christ.
Yeah. 
storms are raging all around you shelter me god i'm safe with you on solid ground i'm hanging on i'm leaning in to you i don't know where you'll take me i don't know Trust your own. 